Welcome back, everybody, for the next talk, which is uh, Jimmy Angelakos from the University of Edinburgh about bridging, bringing sorry, the semantic web closer to reality, PostgreSQL as RDF graph database. Go ahead. Thank you. So I tried to break the world's longest title record, but uh, I think there are people that beat me to it, so I added an extra bit. Or how to export your data for, to someone who's expecting RDF. So um, what is the semantic web and what is RDF? How many of you inside here know what RDF is? Oh, OK. That's, that's great, because everyone at the graph dev room knew what RDF was. So uh, it's a way to um, overcome the limitations of HTML and make the web machine readable. So uh, the way to do it, some people think, is to add metadata to everything. And one way to add metadata to everything is RDF, which is a data model that lets you turn everything into a graph, actually a multi-graph, because multiple objects can have multiple things pointing to it, to them. And um, it's, uh, it's also, strictly speaking, in graph theory, it's a labeled and directed graph, which means that not only objects have properties, but those properties usually have directions as well. So uh, it's person A authored book A. This is a direction, whereas you can't go back the other way using the property authored because the book obviously hasn't authored the person. Um, so instead of the entity attribute value model that we're used to, we've given them fancy names and now they're called subject predicate object in RDF. The subject is the thing that we're talking about, the predicate is the property or action taken by the subject, and the object is the recipient of that property or action. So as these are three things, we call them RDF triples. And triples usually have URIs encoded in them that let you instantly access the referenced thing. So in this silly example, we have an example org person, which is called Mark Twain, who, is, who uh, has the predicate example org relation author to link to an example org book. In a more real world example uh, of the style that we are going to look at in a minute, it's uh, and Edina is CUK. Uh, I work at Edina at the University of Edinburgh, and we do lots of software development and bibliographic stuff mostly, as well as some uh, geospatial stuff. But here we're just going to talk about text. So uh, we have an Edina is CUK item that has uh, DC is Dublin Core. It's a way to encode metadata for uh, things like records and books and journals and articles. And it has a title. And the title here, we can see that it's a literal. It doesn't have to be a URI. You can encode a literal in RDF, because how else can you give the full breadth of information that you need to share? So what we have are namespaces that allow us to make this whole thing a bit shorter. So we can bind namespaces, for example, DC elements, which are all the things in Dublin Core that can be encoded in RDF. And we can bind them to the prefix DC. So we can just say DC title this, instead of writing the whole URL for everything. Now, to store our triples, we need triple stores. And triple stores are what offer persistence to our graph. So it's a way, basically, to put it on disk and index it and query it. So for this purpose, we went down a um, route that not many people use. We used RDF lib, which is a library in Python, 
and we used an extension which is called RDF Lib SQL Alchemy. Unfortunately, there used to be an extension that connected RDF Lib directly to Postgres, but it's now being abandoned and the author says please use SQL Alchemy instead. So it's pretty clear by now that we decided to use Postgres to store all these triples. And how can you do that? Because Postgres is a relational database. How can you turn it into a graph? And we're going to let RDFLib do this for us. Also, uh, excuse me, RDFLib supports querying of this database once you create it via the query language, which is called Sparkle. Now, Sparkle isn't very pretty to look at, but once you get your head around the strange syntax, which should appear strange to everyone in here who knows SQL, once you get past that, it's actually as functional as SQL. Now, the bad thing is that there aren't many Sparkle uh, databases that perform well, but we're going to look into that in a minute. So let's look at the original data that we had that we wanted to encode into triples. So originally, we had some JSON records stored as JSONB in Postgres. And our main identifier for those records, because we didn't have serial IDs or any other columns, we just had one big column which was called data. And this is pretty much what it contained. Um, our identifier is the DOI, which is uh, the digital object identifier. And it's a pretty much standard way for academics to, and other people to <laughs> identify uh, digital objects, whether those objects are a file, or an article, or a book, or a data set. So it's, it's basically a pointer that redirects you to that object. So it can be used as a URL, as we can see here, but this URL only points at the resolver, which is dxdoi.org. So you just ask the resolver to give you a, a redirect to the actual object. And we also see that we have other metadata, like uh, title, and created at date, index date, and so on. I haven't the space on screen to put on everything. So um, let's start a little bit to look at the Python code that allows you to make a simple graph on disk inside Postgres. So, of course, you have to import PsychoPG2, which is the, uh, let's say, best Postgres connector right now. Unfortunately, it's not pure Python. So if you want a pure Python solution, then you have to go with PG8000 or something like that. And unfortunately, those don't perform as well. Why would you like to do that? Because usually, you don't have uh, the Postgres libraries compiled for weird systems like embedded systems and ARM uh, machines. But anyway, let's go on in our Wintel world and assume that everyone can use x86 uh, libraries. So we import a few things from rdflib that let us create the graph in memory. And we also import the extension, which is called RDF SQL Alchemy, which lets us transfer this thing to Postgres. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we also have two namespace declarations. We create two namespace objects. And one of them is our own. It's private. I mean, even if you try to access this URL, you won't be able to get anything because it doesn't exist. It's an arbitrary namespace that we use to describe the objects inside our database. And Prism is actually a fairly standard namespace that uh, gives you some bibliographic types of metadata you can use to encode an RDF. So we register the plugins, we give it a database URI, and we say that uh, please use Postgres, please use PsychoPG, my user, my password, a local host, and a database that we created called RDF Graph which we're going to put our data in. And we also have to give this graph a name. 
so that we can find it in the database. So this is the context that we're giving it and we're giving it in the Adena namespace. So we're going to be creating a graph called Adena slash RDF graph. So we tell the plugin to open the data store that we described using SQL Alchemy and also put everything under Adena RDF graph, which is our context. And then we just do uh, graph open, create equals true, and that creates the tables in the database. Unfortunately, it doesn't until you run a commit or you add something to the database. So at this stage, it doesn't have the tables, even though we've run the create true. So we do a couple of binds to write two things in the database. We bind the namespaces to the uh, abbreviations Adena and Prism, so we can easily use them later on. And um, we start to create our triples. So we make an empty list of triples, and we start to populate it with things. So we create an Adena item, which is just an object in the Adena namespace, and we give it a URL, a URI, which is item slash a number, which we're going to use as our identifier for our own database. And I'm just giving it one for now. So we create a triple, and we actually create this as a Python tuple. So we give it an item that we have created. We, the predicate is the type. So it has an RDF type of a DINA item. We're actually telling the object what it is. And we also give it some properties. So we create another triple for the same item. And we tell it that its DOI is this string here. Now, you may wonder why this is not a URI and it's a literal. And unfortunately, the answer is that many valid DOIs result in invalid URLs that are resolved correctly. So that's a problem. Your parser will reject this, uh, not, not the specific one. Your parser will reject the DOI as an, in, in, as an invalid URI, but the resolver will work for some strange reason. So the safest way is just to encode it as a literal. And here is what allows us to do this in a great scale, because we have many records to talk about. And this is the function called add n. And add n goes through your, your list of triples uh, in a nice Pythonic loop here. and adds everything, does a list operation on this list, and adds everything to our database, which is called GDB here. Why don't you add a triple at a time and you prefer to do it as a batch? It's much faster to do it with batching than just adding a triple, adding a triple. And then our last step to export our data and give it to someone else in RDF format is just a dot serialize. We do a serialize on the whole graph. The whole graph is exported in the turtle format, and we just give it to the person who's waiting for it. Here comes the big moment. We've only created two triples. How does this thing scale? And what is big data? Big data is when you have lots of data. I mean, there's nothing to it. It's just taking the same principles that you applied to your 10 or 10,000 records and make it scale to 10 billion records. So how do you supersize this thing? Uh, first of all, you have to loop over the original database contents in our JSONB table. You have to create the triples in RDFlib in Python. And then you need to find an efficient way to add them to the graph because this whole interface between uh, RDFlib, SQL Alchemy, and Postgres has some significant overhead. And then you need to find a way to serialize the graph efficiently. How do you create an RDF output? Do you create the whole thing in memory? Do you have three terabytes of memory? I don't think so. 
but why do big data without Java is a question that I've heard. Um, also, why do you do graphs without Java? Because everything is so standard. We can use Gremlin and Blueprints and Tinkerpop and Jenna and all those things. Um, and the reason is that all those uh, things are frameworks and they add significant processing overheads. And these are things that you cannot do at scale on your own desktop hardware. So uh, why don't you use an existing triple store database was another question. It's because I'm a Postgres guy is one easy answer. The, uh, and because we know and trust Postgres not to lose our data and not to crash because it's been working reliably for 20 years or so. And I also heard a question that but why didn't you use so-and-so database? Because our database is the only graph DB that does so-and-so. But those people don't tell you that they run this on very, very expensive servers with very expensive SSDs and very expensive sticks of RAM. So this argument is invalid. Uh, we can just run it in a few lines of code. This whole project was less than maybe 200 lines of code. 200 lines of code is looping through a graph in Java without doing any of the other things that we're going to do. And we also have to take in mind that uh, this is an, an optimized method. I just used whatever components I could find and had to hack a few libraries to get them to work reliably with a great data set but there is potential for improvement. This is all open source. Most people will try to push you towards a closed source database if you want to do big data and analytics and graph operations and so on. So let's look at a little bit of familiar code for, everyone who, for anyone who's used uh, Postgres under Python. And we'll see that we open a connection and we create a cursor and then we create a sequence that we're going to use to name our objects. We need some integers for our object identifiers in the Adena namespace. So as we're reading the database, we're creating objects in the graph database. And in order to read efficiently the database, we have to use a named cursor in Postgres. Because if you don't use uh, a server-side cursor in this code, what Python is going to try to do, well, actually PsychoPG, is load the whole database in RAM. And that is something that you do not want. So we create a cursor on the server side. We give it some large uh, batch sizes to loop through. So uh, we give it an iteration size of 50,000 JSON records, and an array size that we're going to use to fetch the data inside Python of 10,000. And then we execute just a select a single column from the table that we have. And the, the loop is very simple. I haven't included the batching code, uh, which is trivial. But all you do is loop every 10,000 records. And for each record, you find the attributes that you're interested in in the JSON data. And if they exist, then you create a new Adina item. And similarly, you create the triples that refer to this object, as we saw in two slides before. So what is our first challenge? Because this seems very simple up to now. The first challenge is RDF LibSQL Alchemy itself. I'm, I don't want to slag it off, but it wasn't written with big data in mind. It's just a few lines of code that let you connect RDF Lib with an on-disk data store. So uh, the version that I started with was auto-committing. 
And that's quite bad because it was trying to insert a statement. When you added a triple, it, it, it issued an insert into, and for the next triple, it issued another insert, and in between, it committed as well. But that has been fixed, fortunately. Now it doesn't auto-commit anymore, but it still tries to, for 10,000 records, do 10,000 inserts. So uh, I changed the code a little bit, and now it does this thing, which we all know and love from Postgres, insert into table, value so and so and so. It also creates lots of indexes, and those should be dropped if you want your inserts to be optimal, because you're going to be inserting. Sorry, I haven't talked about the data size. Uh, the DOIs that we're talking about uh, are all the DOIs that have ever been issued. So we're talking about 100 million DOIs and the metadata that come with each DOI. So uh, the final database size was around 3.5 billion triples. So those indexes must be dropped if you want to insert efficiently. Our second challenge is if this thing stops, we have to restart our select and we have to restart inserting. So we have to get rid of our graph database because we don't know if we're going to insert the same things twice. So in order to deduplicate and be able to continue, uh, we just use an offset from our select, from our original select. We do a, a select data from my table offset, the number of records that we know we've processed. And we also do some deduplication in order to uh, not insert the same object twice. So if we have a publisher, which is University of Edinburgh, then we want all records that were published by University of Edinburgh to point to that specific object. We want to point it to the, rec the Edina record for University of Edinburgh. So one way to do it is you cache it in RAM. It's just text, so it doesn't take up lots of RAM. So the way to do it is you write a Sparkle query, which you prepare for execution. And all the Sparkle query does, it, it finds organizations in the FOF namespace. FOF is friend of a friend. It's a namespace that lets you identify persons and organizations and online accounts of these persons and so on. And you just extract the label, so the title of each organization, and you put it all in a nice Python dictionary that you can refer to so you know what your serial, what your object identifier is that you've already inserted in the database. So before you insert, before you resume inserting, you select all the things that you've inserted in the database that you know are going to be replicated, such as persons and uh, organizations, uh, publishers, and you put them in a cache that you can go through. So if you find a key in your JSON data, which is publisher, you just say publisher found. Uh, you go through the cache, and you see if you have encountered this publisher before. If you have, then you use that data identifier for the same publisher. If you don't, you create a new record and insert this publisher. So what is the third challenge? The third challenge, again, has to do with uh, RDF lib SQL Alchemy, which tries to select the whole graph in memory when you're trying to do this. So you hack the code a little bit, and you find some SQL Alchemy code which specifies execution options. So for this query, you just run uh, the uh, option stream results equals true. And all this does is creates a server-side cursor in Postgres and streams the results to Python instead of trying to load them all inside Python's memory. And we also added uh, a batching loop, which every 1,000 records, this is totally arbitrary, 1,000 worked best for my desktop machine. It yields, and so it continues the loop. Also, RDF libsql alchemy has the tendency to cache all the literals that it's found up to that moment in RAM, and that code was deleted. 
because it's totally inefficient when you're trying to do massive batch operations like this. <clears throat> so the next step, once you've inserted everything inside your database and you have a fully fledged graph database that lives inside of Postgres, is you want to serialize it. And uh, serializing is a CPU intensive operation because RDF lib tries to transform one type of data into another. So uh, we did it using multiprocessing, which is a Python module that lets you uh, fork additional processes. So we create a few processes that are the workers. We have a writer process that takes ownership of uh, standard output so that we can write directly to standard output and pipe it into other things. And we create queues that we send batches of data to so we can process them in small uh, forked processes that don't have a large memory footprint. So we send 100 records at a time to the worker process. It finishes, then dies, because Python is not good at freeing up your memory. So we actually kill the process. We spawn a new one. And generally, it's much better to deal with the context switching of all of this thing than having uh, Python processes balloon and never give their memory back. So all you do is you run the Python script uh, that serializes the data and you pass it through split. Uh, you give it some uh, numeric identifiers for the output files and you split the files every four gigabytes just so you don't have any huge files to load later on. And those RDF files will be in n-triples format because n-triples is better than turtle which we used in the initial example because turtle actually tries to uh, condense all your data for a specific object inside of that, underneath that object, and it also tries to sort everything. So there is no efficient way to serialize in Turtle because it, it, the whole database has to fit in memory to do that. So we just output in the simplest possible format, which is n-triples. And we also compress it on the fly. This caused an unexpected problem that we'll go into, uh, but it generally worked fine. I mean, it seemed to utilize most of our CPUs with uh, little overhead, and this is just a desktop machine. It had 16 gigs of RAM, and the memory footprint was 400 megabytes. So you can do it on pretty much anything. So here is our fifth challenge, is the serialization. We were creating n triples at a rate with all our four CPUs that uh, could not be written to disk fast enough. So it was, in essence, an undetected memory leak. The process kept getting bigger and bigger, but it was actually not fast enough. The disk was not fast enough to absorb all of those triples. So we fixed that uh, by uh, using gzip, which is much lighter than bzip2. And we also, uh, I mean, uh, CPU-wise, and uh, we also changed the code to empty those queues uh, of batches and wait for the standard output to flush before we continue with the next batch. So that slowed things down about 5%, but when you're outputting that, that much data, it doesn't ma matter. I mean, 5% is acceptable. So this is what the Postgres tables look like when you've filled the database. So it, uh, SQL Alchemy creates those ugly names and puts all of your records inside tables. So literal statements go into this table and URIs go into this table, namespace binds go into this table. So you can imagine that we have tables that have billions of records in them. And Postgres handled them like a champ. I mean, no problems at all. The only problem is that the indexes created for uh, those things were B3 indexes, which were very large. So <clears throat> let's look at one record now. And a record has our uh, table ID. It has uh, a subject, which is our 
a DINA object, a predicate that says this uh, this uh, object was associated with this agent, which is a person. So this is all it needs. Uh, you don't need complicated uh, objects in Java. You don't need uh, messy serializations from and to binary. We're just using text here. More problems. Uh, Please make sure you don't enter literals in a field that is marked as URI because uh, Python will complain. When you try to serialize a URI that is not a URI, uh, you're going to have problems. Fortunately, our data was relatively well behaved, so uh, we only had about 88 records out of uh, 100 million that had invalid DOIs. Unfortunately, you can't convince those people to change their uh, resolvers because they do tend to resolve those invalid URIs. So some of those things uh, failed when you tried to URL encode them. So you're always going to have a few bad apples. Uh, also, we mentioned the indexing issue your indexes for a data set of this size are going to be huge. So we need to find a way to change this RDFlib SQL Alchemy code to better utilize full text search related indexes like GIN uh, because B-Tree doesn't really scale for this sort of thing when you're trying to search for particular strings or expressions. Also, one other problem we faced was that we had some uh, content fields which contained um, base64 encoded bytes, and some of them were bigger than 10 megabytes. RDFlib does not handle this well. It tries to convert everything into text and copies it multiple times, so you end up with a memory footprint for a 10 megabyte file you end up with a memory footprint of, sorry, a 10 megabyte uh, record, your memory footprint goes to maybe two or three gigabytes. So it doesn't really scale. Please make sure you don't have unnecessarily long records, or if you do, link them uh, from outside the graph database. You also need to drop the indexes before you uh, create, which makes things more complicated if you have to restart because in order to select all your publishers and persons you have to have an index because your operation will never finish if you don't so you need to recreate the indexes and spend a couple of hours waiting uh, so PG dump is your friend when all the indexes have been created just do a PG dump which gives you all the drop and create statements so you can do it at will and please make sure you have enough maintenance work memory because if you try to create a uh, hundred gigabyte index with 64 megabytes of maintenance work memory that will not go well. So this is what uh, PG dump gives you and it's just a huge number of indexes and primary keys that are created so uh, you don't need all of them but find out which ones you need in order to do your selects if you want to restart. Thank you very much. Uh, our Adina developer blog is at Labs Adina ICUK, UK where we uh, have started uh, putting up interesting snippets of code and things we're working on. And the hack will go up on GitHub on RDF Lib SQL Alchemy, unfortunately. That's a, a commit I haven't pushed to GitHub yet, but I'll do it very soon. So some people have also asked me for this huge data set to play with. I'll check out what we can share from the university, and I'll be sure to share what I can with you. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jimmy. And we have time for questions. So please wait for the microphone. Yeah, so um, what kind of schema do you use in Postgres to store these triples uh, underneath all these layers of RDF? 
this thing here. Um, I didn't choose it. It's mm -hmm. what RDF Lib SQL Alchemy tries to create. So uh, all it does is it creates very simple tables with subject, predicate, object, and so on, mm -hmm. and fills those tables with all our triples. So it's only uh, five tables, and two of them are the really large ones. One that yeah, contains the URIs and one that contains the strings. Okay, so just the triples themselves, basically, uh, directly. Uh, and does Spark QL, I, uh, I don't really know it very well, but I think it would just support uh, recursive queries, or what would in SQL be recursive queries. Um, does, uh, does it, and if so, uh, is such a query mapped to the database, or does uh, the software need to load everything in memory? To, uh, uh, I didn't try to do very advanced mm -hmm. Sparkle queries, but uh, I'm sure that RDF lib supports the full Sparkle query set. Hmm. So these tend to work as fast as your SQL query would work inside Postgres. So we can use this. Uh, that's another good example, is we can use it to serve an API directly from our Postgres that serves Sparkle queries with the performance that we expect from Postgres and not some Java thing which will have a huge memory footprint and need tens or hundreds of servers to reply. Um, do you know if Sparkle is as expressive as SQL or more expressive? Uh, it's, it doesn't have all the features that we're used to in advanced SQL, but you can do many things and you can also do multi-dimensional queries. Which you can yeah, but I meant the other way around. Can any Sparkle query be translated to an SQL query? No, not directly. Okay. It, maps, yeah. it maps the things that it needs to select from our relational database into relational queries, no. uh, and that's done by RDF Lib SQL Alchemy. So, uh, the better we hack SQL, uh, RDF Lib SQL Alchemy's code, the better the queries will be. Okay, thank you. Are there more questions? Please. Sorry. Thank you. Right, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm still, I'm still, I mean, very interesting. I'm still just slight. I'm looking, thinking of that slide. I'm trying to work out the relationship between the graph database and the you know, the traditional uh, relational one. And I see there's a subject, predicate, object. And then I see three other fields. I can, I can, you know, there's an ID. That's fine. But then you've got a context and a term. So the context tells us that this data belongs to our. Uh, named graph which is called RDF graph and term comb is some term combination thing that I haven't used and don't know how to use and it's, it, it always it's always zero in our data for some reason yeah, that seems like a lot of wasted space on, on, a, ver on a large data set um, yes <laughs> the, the other question I had is I, I thought you mentioned this earlier and it was touched on the last question too is you know the, you're gonna have these these uh, you can have your uh, Sparkle queries, and they're going to get mapped to you know database operations, which is the Postgres DBA we would understand. Um, you know, uh, the indexing for that. How much time do you spend thinking about where you need to put your Postgres indexes and tuning it? Um, you basically have all those indexes to consider, so, so you don't need all of them. Uh, you just uh, the best way would be to run your query and just analyze it and see what tables and what columns it's hitting. Right, okay, so all the indexes come pre-built with the like yes, SQL algorithm. Yes, you're not, you're not thinking of adding extra ones. You can, of course you can, but uh, it all depends on what your, uh, what RDF Lib SQL Alchemy is trying to select from your database. So on the, it all depends on the generated query. Uh, so you have to enable logging to find that statement and uh, okay. analyze it to create your indexes. Okay, but you haven't you haven't been adding extra indexes so far in finding complex queries. I didn't really have a use for indexes in this project uh, until I mean it will need indexes if it's going to be connected to an API which will serve things directly from the database. That the but the only use case I had for the indexes up to now was to restart the insert well, this operation. Is, this is data loading, which is different from getting it out again at the other end. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? 
If not, then let's thank Jimmy again. Thank you. The next talk will be about the evolution of fault tolerance in Postgres at 3 o'clock. So they have a 20-minute break. <laughs>